if I can cut one, and that is just, boy, this is going to sound really silly to you, silly to them, but I thought he was one of the most honest presidents. And the reason I tell people that, kind of with little humors, he was the first guy who said, I'm an actor. I'm an actor. Whereas all the other presidents performed, right. you know, members of the Council on Foreign Relations, but all this, they were, you know, one guy's a peanut farmer, you know, nuclear right. physicist. Yeah, he's the first one who said, I act with monkeys. You know, you that's know, well, Reagan they used anyway. to, was a joke back in the Reagan administration, uh, what's the difference between a president and an actor? <laughs> well, one one wears makeup and uh, one wears makeup and reads prepared lines. The other one is makes movies. You know. <laughs> so anyway, Reagan's in. He's speaking. Yeah. One of the first things that Ronald, Ronald Reagan did as president was to authorize the bailout of communist Poland. Yeah. And I okay. thought, well, wait right. right now. This is not. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and they're treating their people out? bad over there too. Yeah. Like why would you want to financially bail out a hardcore Stalinist country? It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And then uh, I re remember picking up the Boston Herald, and they said there was a little little tiny article. It wasn't a headline, but it was a little tiny piece. It said U.S. government sends half a billion dollars worth of weapons to communist China. Oh, yeah. that, they may have said mainland China. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I thought, wait a minute now. Why do you? Why are we sending our money? Why are we giving? Are we giving to? We, did, is, well, we were told people. that we need an army to defend against. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the whole idea was, well, they was they were the good communists, and they're fighting the, the bad communists, of the Russians, and what have you. But then I learned that we also did the same thing to the Russians uh, earlier on in the Nixon administration. So yeah. it was those kinds of things that really get me troubled. And uh, it was a friend. Uh, he was at that time my landlord and a former a, a Boston policeman and a boxer. I had a lot of a lot of respect for him. He handed me a book. I tell you what, books are the things that did it for, do it for a lot of people. Somebody just casually hands you a book, and if you read it, it can be a life-changing experience, you know. Yeah. And this book was called Nixon, the Man Behind the Mask by Gary Allen, who uh -huh. also wrote a book called Nundere Call It Conspiracy. And I read the book, and I said, That's this just made a lot of sense. And I asked him where it came from, and he told me the John Birch Society. Now, he was not a member, mm -hmm. but he was very sympathetic to the society. And I thought, well, I heard all these things that they're racist and they don't like Jewish people, and I'm of part Jewish uh, descent. I wouldn't want to join an anti-Semitic group. But I heard some good things, too. I remember Ray Shamey running for the Senate in Massachusetts, and I liked him. And I know that Ray Shamey wasn't too well liked by John Kerry, and, and I thought, well, if Kerry doesn't like Ray Shamey because he's a John Birch member, they must, he must have some redeeming, the organization must have some redeeming <laughs> yeah, something values. Good about him, yeah. So Kerry yeah. actually was one of the guy that got, one of the men that got me interested in the John Birch Society from, a, from a, his negative position. So like a lot of people in those days, I just wrote to the headquarters, which used to be in Belmont, and they sent me a packet with a magazine and some literature and what have you, and I read this stuff, and I didn't see anything that was racist. I did, in fact, I saw there were some articles by black members of the Birch Society, and I thought, I'll give it a shot, and here I am uh, all these years later. That uh, was 1988. That's a good thing. Yeah. You know, part of what I, what I pulled off when you said, you know, I'm thinking as you're speaking, and I'm listening, and um, one, back when you said, gee, you know, we were giving weapons to what was then, you know, considered a, a non-friendly, you know, group or whatever. In this case, a communist group, people that have tyranny and oppression and, you know, total control of the society. I was working at General Dynamics through the 80s, okay, building weapon systems in, in, and stuff. In uh, Weymouth? In, in California. Oh, California. Uh, in, in California. I was out there for a bunch of years. But one thing I noticed and I picked up on, um, I had family members that worked at General, Di General Electric here in um, Lynn, and they made gas turbine engines, jet engines for fighters and all that. And they said, we're sending fully instrumented um, F-404s, which were the latest engine we put High in our tech, best, yeah. uh, we put in our best fighter aircraft. The F-15 used these, the F-18 used these, and I'm like, well, what do you mean we're sending them to China? And we didn't just send them engines; we sent them fully instrumentated engines, so that if you were going to replicate this engine, hey, I'd really like to know how much strain is on that bearing. I'd really like to know the temperature inside this, you know, in the different sections of the gas turbine. And I'm like, we did what? Yeah. How, you know, it wouldn't make sense to me because these people, once again, are enemies. This is, what, 1980, late 80s? This is in the 80s. Yeah. And then I realized at some point in the defense industry that by giving them these new bells and whistles, to, that would make the defense industry here say, well, gosh, they got those fancy engines. We need better engines. We need faster planes. We need stealth technology. You know, it kept that game going, what's called the arms race or whatever you want right. to call it. That was one thing I got from what you were saying. The other thing is that, and you had mentioned, and you said, you know what, it's what's the tail end was the media end of it. And it's not just the stereotypical, gee, let's do John Birch, but let's think about what the media has done for my viewers. Every night they go home, they turn on that conditioning box. That's right. And now they'll spend eleven thousand dollars to get a fancy condition, you know, television. High definition, right on exactly. the uh, uh, but, plasma and all that good stuff. Yeah. yeah. And so here, here I am saying to myself, um, that programming end of it. 
I've seen it so many times. They programmed us with global warming, oh. which turns out to which turns out to be you know untrue. And lots of scientists say, hey, guess what? The sun's putting out more energy. NASA turns around and says the sun's irradiance has increased past the normal 11-year cycle and went 14 years this time. And I guess now past six months it's been and now colder. we're in a cooling trend. Again. Well, I was going to say, how many people of our viewers know that it's snowed in Jerusalem this year? In Baghdad for the exactly. first time. Exactly. I mean, this yeah. is like, in you Johannesburg, know. Johannesburg, South Africa. And China's yeah. had their coldest winter on, on record, yet we're still being sold, hey, carbon footprint. We'll get into that in a bit, but it's the Good, because that, that's a good topic. Hey, can you tell us who John Birch was, how it started, what, you know, Well, what yeah, about? John Birch was a, uh, he was actually born in the missionary field in India. And his parents were missionaries to India, of course. And he was later settled and lived in New Jersey for a while, but uh, was raised in Macon, Georgia. Okay. And uh, went to a theological school. He was a Baptist, uh, became a Baptist minister. And as a very young man, he was in his early 20s, went into the missionary field, which is now communist China. Back then, uh, I guess I understand the only people who seemed to care about uh, China were Christian missionaries because it was, they looked at it as a ripe field of people, who, and they were receptive to the, to the gospel, the Christian gospel. So he uh, lived in uh, China, and he was very successful. He learned the, the language. He, was a, he mastered the language, which for, from Anglos, I guess it's pretty difficult to master it, but he was able to do it. He just had an affinity for it, or we could say a gift. And he was organizing churches, and he was very well respected, and he was a real leader. And he lived on the Chinese diet, too. You know, uh, and he, uh, so he didn't put himself above the Chinese people. He, you know, he had a great love for them. Well, um, war had broken out. Uh, of course, the Japanese were already firmly entrenched in China year, uh, several years before Pearl but, Harbor. Right, but yeah, okay. And uh, Pearl Harbor uh, uh, went and came and gone. Now we're at war with, now we're at war with Japan. Hmm. And uh, in April, the following year, April of uh, 41, uh, 42, there was a famous mission over Tokyo, the uh, Doolittle Yes, the Doolittle Mission. Rate. Right. And it wasn't so much Flying the military. Flying B-25s or something B -25s off, of air, off, off aircraft, aircraft cars. cars which has and they had been no done. way home. They, that's right. They bombed Japan and then had to continue flying. And they had a, either they had a bailout. They they couldn't land anywhere. There was no place to land, and they didn't have enough fuel to. Or range to come back, and they weren't made they, to land on carriers. They couldn't. They couldn't yeah. come back. Yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, two of the crews had crashed uh, at a certain location in China, and John Birch was um, in a little Chinese restaurant getting something to eat, and uh, a Chinese man went up to him and he said, "Are you an American?" He said, "Yes. Follow me." And in a little, uh, I guess they call them sampans, a little boat mm -hmm. where these uh, inside the hiding in the boat were the Doolittle and his crew. And uh, wow. the question was, uh, are you an American? And he had the, you know, a Georgian accent. And they were afraid that maybe some of the Japanese who were raised in the United States would, and with his thick southern accent, no, he said, that's not, that's not a Japanese, that's, that's an American, you know. And uh, he, anyway, he, he brought them to safety. And um, he ended up becoming uh, a, a captain in the uh, U.S. Army Air Corps. Wow. He served under General Chenault as an intelligence officer. Yeah, okay, I remember and Chenault. And he spent most of his time behind enemy lines. He was very courageous. He was decorated. And he was a very humble guy. He didn't want the decorations, didn't want the medals. Two weeks after the truce was signed on the Big Mo, he was, a, uh, he was on a mission. Uh, and he was intercepted by a, a Chinese communist patrol. Now, we were told by the media in this country, that a lot of the media members and all of the, there was a dozen books all telling us that Mao Zedong was a great guy and a great, a great reformer. Sixty million people later. Yeah, oh, exactly. Sorry. Well, anyway, he was brutally murdered by these, the, these Chinese communists, and our State Department hushed up how he was killed. And when uh, Robert Welch, uh, who was the founder of the John Birch Society, um, he uh, Robert Welch, uh, right after World War II, was obviously very concerned about what was happening in this country. Wrote some books. Uh, came across the story of John Birch through Senator Nolan of California, and wrote a little book. In fact, I brought uh, kind of a, a hardback copy, The Life of John Birch, and uh, he looked at it, even though John Birch was not necessarily uh, someone you'd see in any. He, he said he wasn't a famous, but he said uh, he was. He looked at he was the best that America had to offer. This very courageous young man selfless person that had a love of uh, what he did, a good, d decent Christian man, very strong moral values, and a lot of his diaries and his writing, his letters to his parents uh, it shows you the character he had. He had planned to stay in China after the war. He was there mm -hmm. for the duration. And uh, with the permission of the Birch parents, he named the organization in, in, in his honor. Wow. And in fact, I got a chance to meet his nephew a couple of years ago who lives in Ohio, and he looks, he'd be, he's in his 50s now, 
but he'd be a spitting image of uh, if he did one of those age progressions. Yeah. So we're very proud of the fact that we're named after this uh, this fine man, and uh, you know, we're taping this in uh, in uh, in April of uh, 08, But just uh, last week, the uh, Falun Gong movement. These are the folks that are being uh, persecuted in China. Not just that, they harvest the organs from them for among, all you Chinese government lovers. Yeah, 